Really excited to talk to you guys today. Uh, I'm Dave Evans. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Fictive. Uh, and so I want to chat with you guys a little bit about 3D printing, uh, distributed manufacturing. So it sounds like you guys all know what 3D printing is and are building physical products. Um, so we'll chat a little bit about that. So I always like to start off with stories. Uh, this is a photo back from 2011, 2012, where I was uh, the lead hardware engineer at Ford's research lab in Palo Alto. So I was the first hire there. This is a picture of TJ and myself just uh, on the first day of opening up the lab. Uh, it's a pretty timely photo that we have. I have my elbow here on what we call a buck. You guys know what a buck is? And you can kind of imagine what it is, but it's essentially the infotainment system of the vehicle. So this is the interior of a car, it's the dashboard, um, and this is one of the major focuses that we were working on at Ford's research lab. So we were looking at the infotainment system and we were figuring out how we could actually build that system better. Uh, I get a lot of questions why Ford would open a research lab in Palo Alto to work on infotainment systems. Um, so what not a lot of people know is this is kind of what a Gantt chart looks like to build physical products, specifically to build a vehicle that when you're thinking about developing a car, it takes anywhere from four to six years to actually build that car. Why? It's mostly the integration of systems, right? It's electrical systems with the mechanical, it's the software inside of it. We have safety, we have engine, we have power, we have all these things that we have to build with. And it takes almost four years to develop that car. But so why is that interesting? Why, why then do we focus on the infotainment system specifically? The real reason is because uh, when you're thinking about that infotainment, it's what the user touches every day. And most of the things that users touch every day in the consumer electronic space is your phones, your laptops you have on your desk that you're holding in your hands. And so when you think about the development cycle of that vehicle versus consumer electronics, this is where things start to get interesting. That when you buy that 2016 Ford Focus, what actually ends up happening is that you're like, man, this touchscreen seems really old, right? It seems like it's back from 2011 or like it's a first gen iPhone. It's because it actually is, right? That it's about six to eight iterations of a consumer electronic device in the time it takes to build a vehicle. So if you think about that, right, that we want to build a better infotainment system, but I have to predict how good technology is going to be six years down the line when I start. So the whole mission behind the lab was how do we think about this, right? How can we build an infotainment system better, faster, actually innovate uh, more efficiently And a lot of these questions? So I spent a lot of my time as a hardware engineer looking at development cycles of how we would actually build uh, the infotainment system itself. And the major question that I kept coming back to over and over again was this. How can I innovate faster, right? And I would challenge all of you guys that are building physical products to think about that. Think about where you're spending time. Think about how you can actually speed up that time. I think something that we don't talk a lot about in the hardware space is that speed aspect. That in software, we're tra we train our software engineers to learn agile, to develop sprints, to do scrum, all these different methodologies to actually build better software. But in hardware, we just say it's hard. It takes too much money. It's really challenging. But the central question we asked ourselves over and over again at Ford was how can we actually innovate faster? Speed was what we were interested in. Time is money. And so if we want to innovate faster, we turned to technology. And the best tool we had at the time when we were opening 2011, 2012 is 3D printing, right? We said that 3D printing is a tool that we're going to use. This is going to be awesome. We're going to leverage this tool and we're going to be able to build better products and we're going to be able to do it faster. And the irony was that about six months after we opened the lab, this article comes out, right? This, this, is, uh, this is basically saying that this machine is going to change the world. This is Brie Pettis, right? CEO, founder of MakerBot. And he's holding this machine and, and it's saying that 3D printing is going to change the way that we manufacture today. That it's lauded that like in the hardware industry that 3D printing really is that next industrial revolution. But the question I'd ask is 3D printing really revolutionizing manufacturing today? Is it really changing the way that you guys are building all of your products? You know, you said that you guys are developing those things. I'd say not yet, right, from my position. And as a 3D printing company, right, is what I do every day, that's a pretty interesting statement, I think, to think about. And it really comes down to the speed, right, that I actually don't need a faster 3D printer. I don't need a better 3D printer. I don't need better resolution. 
I need better tools, right? I need a better ecosystem to actually build hardware. Is that machine gonna help me build a better infotainment system? Maybe for a couple weeks of it. But the major question that we kept coming to over and over again at Ford was that it wasn't about actually speeding up development where technology was the bottleneck. It really came down to this one core word. It was around access. It was saying, how do we actually access these tools better? How are we able to access not just a maker bot, but a whole suite of tools to build a better infotainment system? So the central goal we had, right, was how do we innovate faster and how do we access better systems? So we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of my time thinking about this word access. So let's step back a little bit and maybe look at how we access technology today. How do you actually go about building physical products? So today's ecosystem, and when I arrived at Ford, was essentially one of a centralized model, right? That if I want to develop a product and I've looked at my tier one suppliers at Ford, that these are large manufacturers that can build almost anything under one roof, right? So names you guys might know in the prototyping space, maybe take a Protolabs, a Shapeways, right? The way that these guys work is a Protolabs is based in Minneapolis, Shapeways is in Long Island. They're able to get away from urban areas which means lower rent costs, lower overhead. It means lower wage workers, so the, the actual workers that are building your products are cheaper. It also means that you can fit a bunch of technologies under one central roof inside of there. So you end up getting, inside of it, many different types of technology. You get excess capacity to build almost anything, and you have these great economies of scale. This is why we moved to a centralized system. In the mass manufacturing world, it's actually really similar, right? j -Bill sponsoring this event. Foxconn's another big one, right? Flextronics is another great example of this. If we look at Foxconn, their largest factory, they call it their city factory. Do you guys know how many people work at the city factory? Guesses? You think 100? It's like four. 400,000 people. They, all, they don't just employ them, they feed them, they house them, they take their kids and, and give them educations as well. That's a centralized system, right? And this didn't come by accident, right? Back in the 19th century was the last industrial revolution. And we, we built this, right? That, that we said, rather than going to five different places to get my you know, shoe made, I could get it made all under one roof. And I got better economies of scale by doing that. But the challenge that I had, right? When Ford said, here, build better infotainment systems. Here's this like this centralized model, all these guys that are around the world that can build that thing for you was that I had to deal with this. I had to deal with layers over and over again. That I would have to get a, a part made, and I'd start at the sales rep. I then would move and like get a quote, go back and forth. They might know a little bit about the process, but not everything. That guy then, we kick off with a PO. He's gonna go to a project rep. That project rep is gonna schedule it for manufacturing. Then an actual an operator is gonna take my part and manufacture it. From there, they're gonna do quality control on side of that, and then give it to a 3PL, a third-party logistics person, to actually ship that out, right? And instead of hardware, we all know hardware is hard, right? Something's gonna go wrong. Something inevitably always goes wrong. And so when something goes wrong, what happens, right? I gotta go back through the system every single time. And I have to sit here, and I have to go say like, hey, sales rep, why did you tap my holes with a 440 when I asked for M3s? Why did you look at my drawing and make this thing in inches, not in millimeters, as it's called out? You guys might laugh, but I actually received a steering wheel back that was this big. What? This big? No, wrong units. And it's because of these layers. It's really challenging. So in mass manufacturing, we have a really good solution for this, right? We say that if you're going to build something, where do you go to build mass manufacturing? China, right? We send our engineers to Shenzhen. They say that if you want to get away from all the layers and you want to deal with that, put your engineer right next to the operator. There's these great photos. I, I, you know, every couple months you'll, you'll read an article about another founder that's been to China, about you know hardware company going to live in there and tell you about it. You might even go to Hacks to join their accelerator program. But what's really interesting is no one does this for prototyping. We sit here and we design our product in California and we have Taiwan making the ID model that's going to be used for the industrial design. It's going to be used for the Kickstarter. I will 
try and save $100 by going to Ohio so that it's machined a little bit cheaper rather than doing it locally. And in that early stages, right, when it's prototyping, time's arguably even more important than in the mass manufacturing phase. You don't even have a product on market yet. So it's really puzzling to me when I first joined of why did we do this? Why did we consider putting our engineers as close to the source in mass manufacturing, but further away in prototyping? So the obvious step was, hey Ford, got to build better infotainment systems. Let's go local, right? Let's get as close to the source as possible. This is what we did. We said, we're a whole bunch of local vendors. We're in Palo Alto. We have one of the best ecosystems for building hardware in the country. So let's do it here. Let's do it locally. And this turned out really well, right? We had really high quality. These guys tend to be craftsmen. A lot of them are here, right? They're really good at what they do. There may be a five to 15 person shop there's only one or two people that are highly skilled, but they're really, really good at that one thing. And there's no organizational layers. I don't have to talk to my sales rep, Sarah, who's then going to talk to the project rep, to the operator, to the QC department. You get one guy. And that was really good. The first order was amazing. Second order was pretty good. Third order was okay. And then it started to go off from there. Then what happens with the local guys is this, right? They have a machine capacity problem and they're time constrained. It's a 15 person shop. How often do they want to like get a phone call from Dave at Ford and say like, you know, can you make 10 of these rather than three of them? They actually don't mind when I call them, right? Because I have a Ford.com. They know I have a billion dollar bankroll behind me. But what happens when I'm a hardware entrepreneur? What happens when I'm a student at Cal Poly and I want it? What happens when you're in a research lab that they haven't heard of because they're not part of the industry? You really get constrained a lot. And so going back to that central question that you guys had that I started with, which was how do you actually innovate faster? This really starts to become a bottleneck. That if you think about as a hardware company, what ends up happening is when you waste time, that's money, right? Your, most, your biggest expense is not the $50,000 tool that you're gonna cut, it's your engineer that you pay six figures to. So every day that you're waiting to get another part is this thing. So we found this out the hard way, right? We did local and we were looking at our burn rate and I'm hiring these guys from all over, all over the place with great degrees and 90% of it's just waiting. We're standing around waiting to get parts back. And if you get really good at your job as an ME, you say you kick off the steering wheel here, I'm gonna kick off the dashboard next and I'm gonna kick off the infotainment system and hopefully this is four weeks, this is three weeks and that's two weeks and everything will arrive on week five. If I'm really good at it, right? That never happens in hardware never happens. So what's next, right? I'm sure you guys can maybe guess what we did after, but really the next major step, the last final frontier that we said is, screw it, I'm gonna get as close to the source as possible. I'm just gonna buy all these things. And we built this, we built an entire room full of these things. I'm a mech -y, right? What do I love doing? I love operating machines, I love building machines. We bought rep wraps, we bought type A's, we built our own rep wraps, we bought MakerBots, whole fleets of MakerBots. Actually MakerBot gave us machines, it was awesome. Right? And these things are really good. I had a low resolution tool. I could build my dashboards relatively well. But what happened when PLA wasn't good enough? What happened when ABS wasn't the right material? What actually happened when I'm hiring engineers from MIT with fluid dynamics master's degrees and they're operating these machines? I'm wasting time, right? So, Ford, what do I do? What's the next step? More machines! Right? I buy bigger, more expensive machines, like quarter million dollars expensive, right? We buy these things. Now I'm not dealing with hobbyist level machines. I'm actually bigger machines that are better and higher resolution. And so what's interesting is like, okay, great, it's a quarter million dollars. That's not that bad for a large company. But the price tag wasn't just the price alone. This is where we spent all of our time. Temperature checks, humidity control, ordering material, cleaning parts, operating the machine, fixing STL files, that the goal of the lab, right, was to innovate faster. The goal was to actually build better infotainment systems. And this is what we ended up doing. Rather than actually building things, we stopped innovating. We stopped spending our time trying to figure out how to decrease that production cycle. We got so wrapped up in the moment of saying, man, centralized doesn't work, local doesn't work, we're gonna buy machines and this is gonna be better, that we actually stopped with the purpose we started with. 
And I can tell you in the last three years that I've been doing Fictive, this is time and time again what entrepreneurs do as well. They go through this same cycle of, I can't get parts fast enough, so I'm gonna buy machines, and then you spend more time operating those machines that is only a very small chunk of your actual development cycle. So we spent a lot of time, we went through this whole cycle and said, what can we do better? And towards the end of my time at Ford, this is where the realization started coming. This was like the true aha moment that I had. That I said, what if we could take the quality and agility of that local shop, right? The highly specialized guys. And if we could combine it with the resources and infrastructure, the superpower that those centralized guys have, what does that system start to look like then? That system then starts to be this connected network of small localized shops that are really good, that have the superpowers of their bigger counterpart. And this is what we call distributed manufacturing. Distributed manufacturing is really the system of locally connected manufacturers for the more efficient production of parts. So a lot of people like distributed manufacturing have never heard that, right? That seems like pretty much a radical idea. Why would you want to change the entire manufacturing industry? And I would actually argue it's not that big of a leap of faith at all. We just have to look back in history to say when was the last time we did it. And so what we're focused on today is really how do we build that better system, right? We're focused on giving entrepreneurs better tools. That what we built today is this network of small shops that have the superpowers of the larger factories so they can optimize and monetize their idle capacity. And what that does for you guys is you can get parts turned around in 24 hours, right? No other shop can do that 365 days a year. That we believe speed matters in your innovation and the ability to connect to these guys is really what allows you to innovate faster across a multiple set of tools. But I'm not here to talk about Fictive, right? It's to talk about an ecosystem. So if we look back to that system, right, and we look at history, we just gotta go to Yield Workshop, right? This is like back pre-turn of the century. This is what it used to look like, that before the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the way that things were built was by cottage industries. That in the cottage industry, you can go read about this, but there was you know, a very efficient machine where you would have specialized people building physical products. And then what happened was at the turn of the century, you ended up with wealthy capitalists that could buy a lot of machines and stick them all under one roof. And then you had the benefits of better economies of scale, standardization, and actually you didn't have to be in the urban areas that these cottage industries had to be in. So it worked really well. It worked well for like an entire century. Then this little thing came along called the internet, right? The world is smaller, it allows us to connect everything together. But when we think about manufacturing, we're still doing the centralized model. We're still doing it all under one roof and not taking advantage of the of scaling the system. So what does it look like, right? What, what is a distributed model? What can that do? So this is Nebbia. Have you guys heard of Nebbia? So Nebbia is building a, a new shower system inside the home. They save anywhere from 90 to 95% of the water usage that a normal shower does. Uh, and they raised over $3 million. They did raise over $3 million on Kickstarter. It's a small lean team. It's like seven to 10 people that are able to build this product. And so if you took the model beforehand of a centralized system, the development cycle spreads out really far. And that burn time, the amount of capital that you need spreads out really far. But when you take a distributed system approach and how we've helped them, you can go from really simple mechanical solutions to higher resolution to even higher to visual models. And you can do those in days rather than weeks or months. And that's what a distributed system allows. It allows you to innovate and actually produce physical parts faster. So we started this talk off about 3D printing, right? And 3D printing is the main tool that a lot of these guys are using today. It's what everyone says. But I would argue that 3D printing is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the beginning to allow you to actually produce better parts. That what I would challenge you guys to think about is you're building your products, as you're working with companies that are building products, as you're manufacturing them yourselves, think about how you can do that more efficiently. How can you do it faster? How can you get better access to tools? And if you do get better access to tools, 
what I would ask you is, what do you think that does for your business alone? But also, what does it do for local manufacturing? What does it actually do for the larger global manufacturing space as well? For the economies of scale that happen when you start doing that? When you don't just do it for 3D printing, but you think about injection molding, PCBs, laser cutting, pad printing, full assembly, that you don't have to do it as a centralized system. That's all I got. I'm Dave. Thanks for listening, and uh, hope you guys learned something.